This is Live Well Talk on Ear Infections in Children. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Union Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital. According to the Journal of American Medical Association, about 50% of children have at least one ear infection by the time they reach their second birthday. Uh, joining us today to discuss ear infections, symptoms, treatments, and prevention is Dr. Uh, Leanne Farley, pediatrician with Union Point Clinic Pediatrics. Dr. Farley, welcome to your Thank first you. podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Don't be surprised that the stardom that comes with attending one of these podcasts and being on there is uh, is can be overwhelming okay. to some of the guests. So, <laughs> you know, um, just stay grounded and uh, you'll be fine. I won't let it go to my head. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> Speaking of head, head has two ears. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain our um, listeners what what is an ear infection? You know, or specifically a middle ear infection. Right. I was going to say, because you really kind of have to figure out what part of the ear we're talking about, because there is otitis externa, and that's going to be an infection of the ear canal. And then there's otitis media, and that is an infection that's behind the eardrum. And that's typically what we think of when we talk about ear infections in kids. Like when a parent comes in asking about an ear infection, it's usually the eardrum behind the ear, or the infection behind the eardrum is what we're talking about. So, so um, an ear infection, you know, the otitis media that's behind the eardrum is usually simply the presence of infected fluid behind the eardrum. And th the eardrum always has fluid back there. No, a lot of times it actually should be able to, there, it should be well aerated behind the eardrum, and it should be able to move back and forth really nicely. And that's where a lot of that you know, sensory hearing comes from is from that movement of the eardrum. Okay. So yeah, right. so so typically there shouldn't be a lot of fluid back there. It actually should be mostly air. And what is it, what's the most common viral bacterial? Um, that's a good question. So when you think about the kind of the pathogenesis or kind of how ear infections start, they're almost always initiated by a viral respiratory infection, like a cold. Um, so that's usually where that whole process starts. And what happens is, kids get a cold, they get their congestion, their runny nose, their cough, all of those kind of symptoms. All of that nasal congestion, all of that inflammation that happens kind of in that upper airway um, re results in the eustachian tube not being able to ventilate very well. And that's the tube that kind of runs from behind the eardrum into the back part of the mouth or the nasopharynx. Um, and that can't ventilate very well when we have issues with congestion and, and things like that that kind of go along with colds. And when that happens, fluid can kind of build up behind the eardrum and then that fluid can get infected. And when we talk about that fluid being infected, that is usually a bacterial infection is what we're talking about. Okay. I, I mean, I get, I've always thought as an adult doctor, and certainly I've, you know, had my rotation in pediatrics and ENT, et cetera, but to me, it's always appeared that it's probably more of an anatomical risk as mm -hmm. far as how that eustachian tube drains. And maybe, mm -hmm. for example, like both my daughters, I don't ever remember them having an ear infection. Mm -hmm. um, I don't ever, neither one had their tonsils out. Uh, now, I know that we'll get into that, how that some of that's changed over the years mm -hmm. as far as, you know, it used to be tubes in your ears and tonsils out were kind of a rite of passage mm -hmm. in elementary school. And that's changed. We'll, we'll get to that. But... Uh, so if, from a risk standpoint, are certain physical anatomy uh, more, more risk? Yeah. Because I have worked out in the urgent cares and yeah. helped cover, particularly when we started up the urgent cares, mm -hmm. where, whenever year that was. And you see a lot of kids come in recurrently mm -hmm. with a uh, ear infection. Yeah, definitely. And um, because it's usually preceded by viral respiratory infections, the kids that are most prone to getting those are going to be at a higher risk for getting ear infections. Makes sense. So, so we're talking a lot of times kids under the age of two, and especially kids that are in daycare settings or things like that, are going to be a little bit, have a little higher rate of getting those infections because they're getting all of those preceding viral infections, those colds. Um, anatomy also definitely plays a role in that. And again, it's usually kids less than two that have a eustachian tube that's shorter, a little more floppy, and a little more horizontal than older kids or adults. And all of those things make it more likely for that eustachian tube to not drain very effectively. Um, and then, you know, genetics and family things being what they are, your anatomy is definitely dictated by some of your, your right, genetic right, makeup. Right, so, yeah. so I have definitely had families where 
you know, I see the baby for their first ear infection and well, brother needed tubes and sister needed tubes and the other brother needed tubes. And I can look at this baby and even though it's only their first ear infection, I can kind of like, oh, I feel like I know what path we're heading down here because right. they all have the same kind of anatomy. So yeah. the eustachian tubes are probably pretty similar. Um, and kind of along those lines too, it's kind of helpful sometimes for me to hear from parents they're like, oh, I had tons of ear infections when I was a kid. I needed to have ear tubes put in, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, we, we'll see if we're heading down that same route. But a lot of times it seems to kind of go that way. I mean, I, I'm very familiar with working in the hyperbaric world mm -hmm. with pressure equalizing tubes, mm -hmm. you know, in there. Um, but how often do kids get tubes nowadays? I mean, it. I guess I couldn't probably give you the numbers. I mean, as far as like when we start talking about putting tubes in for kids, there's definitely some guidelines that we have, you know, both from like the otolaryngology societies and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it's usually if you were talking four or more infections in a year or three or more infections within the past like three months or six months or something along okay. those lines, I think it's a six months. Yeah. Three in the last six months. So, um, so those are kind of the guidelines. Now I feel like there's some, there's some room on, on that too. You know, like for example, if I am seeing a kid who's going to be turning three in a couple of months and they've had four ear infections in the past year, but they're almost three and it's April, I'm kind of like, mm, we might be able to see how things go here. Get out and of the flu and cold We're getting season. out of cold and flu season. We're getting older. So I think we're going to kind of start outgrowing those ear infections. If I have a 13 month old who's had four ear infections and it's November, we're having a different conversation. Then I'm kind of talking like, mm, we might need to be heading towards, you know, getting the ENT referral and all that kind of stuff. So, so even though we kind of have our guidelines as far as when to refer for tube placement and things like that. I, I feel like there's, you, know, you can kind of use your clinical judgment a little bit on that too, as, as to when it's appropriate, so. And in the same treatment for the bacterial, obviously be antibiotics. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of antivirals. In the pediatric world, it's the same as adult world. Like if I'm not too sure what the patient has, I go, ah, it's probably viral. Mm -hmm. Do you yes. guys do that oh, too? Yes, for okay. sure, yeah. And right. the nice thing about peds is I feel like it usually is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We don't just have to guess. It's right. usually viral, <laughs> usually I, with them. My so. wife, like, what, what do they mean by it's probably viral? Because it means they really don't know what's going on. Yeah, And yeah. the patient's probably going to get right. better. Exactly, so, exactly. You know. And kids are great at getting viruses, and they're also great at recovering from them. Yes. So, so most of the time, you can feel pretty safe. Like, that's probably what it is. Yes, but, the kiddos yeah. get sick quick, healthy quick. Healthy quick, exactly. It really is. Yep, yep for amazing. sure. So, and I mean, and when you talk about treatment for ear infections, it's kind of... It's kind of an interesting thing a little bit because, you know, guidelines on that have also kind of changed over the years where, um, you know, as of right now, if we have a kiddo that's less than two years old that has a pretty significant ear infection in terms of both ears are infected, fevers, increased fussiness, poor sleeping, all of that kind of stuff, then it's pretty clear this child needs an antibiotic to treat that ear infection. Um, if we have an older kiddo that maybe has pretty mild symptoms, no fevers, maybe a little bit of ear pain, but you know, not too bad. We actually have options sometimes of actually just observing and seeing if they'll kind of clear that on their own. Because a lot of older kids actually can clear infection, ear infections, even bacterial ones, on their own without necessarily needing antibiotics. So, so it kind of depends a little bit on the severity of the infection that's present and also the age of the child as far as whether it's an instant we need to do the antibiotic or if we can kind of maybe kind of wait and just see how they do on their own. Which, which isn't untrue from a lot of upper respiratory mm -hmm. tract yes. infections yeah. that I've often over the years given people the antibiotic back when we did them on paper, you know, mm -hmm. a script pad. Yeah said here you know if you're not better in two or three days fill this but take all of it yeah you know? yeah and 80 yeah. percent of the time they'd say i never filled it yeah you know, i got yeah. better mm -hmm. so I, I think that's there's a lot of truth to that mm -hmm. treatment amoxicillin's in shortage have you experienced that yes it has been very interesting tell us about lately. that well so i mean that's not something we routinely prescribe here in the hospital no, so yeah, it's like no, no, i hear about it yeah amoxicillin is the first line treatment for ear right, infections right. and ear infections are the most common infection that we see in the pediatric office that would, we would prescribe antibiotics for. So, so we're dealing with a really common infection that we prescribe antibiotics for a lot, winter season, when we usually see more episodes of ear infections, and then we have this amoxicillin shortage. And, um, and it has definitely made things rather interesting for us. So um, what we're kind of trying to, a lot of times we've had to kind of go to our, 
our next best or our backup options as far as treatment for the ear infections if we haven't had amoxicillin readily available. Um, I think what's also been kind of interesting is just you're never really sure from day to day who has what. So one day, I know this pharmacy has amoxicillin, so it's like, okay, I'm gonna send everything there, and then the next day they're out. So then yeah. I have to go find this, this pharmacy, yeah. and, um, and and it's hard to because since everything's electronic, you know, it's kinda like, okay, well, let's try this pharmacy instead, and I send it in. And then, you know, however long it takes the very busy pharmacy to kind of get to it, and, they're, and then they're calling like, oh no, we don't have it either okay, well, let's try the next one. So really what it's been a lot of times is me talking to our poor nursing staff and just being like, can you please just start calling some of these pharmacies yeah. before I actually send the prescription? In? <laughs> so, and you know, they're, they're busy and overworked too. So they're, they're having to kind of take extra time to actually call the pharmacy. Do you have this? Do you have this suspension? Like, do, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and that's just made it a little bit and, more and work. I guess in the hospital setting, you know, we have a drug uh, shortage supply work group and, email chain and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it really has come to the point where that's just part of doing business. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just it part is. of just getting things done. Yeah. No, I think we're kind of getting used to it a little bit yeah. now for better or worse. Every day. <laughs> you know, it used to be periodically there'd be a mm -hmm. hurricane in Puerto Rico and we don't have no, saline. Don't have, yeah. <laughs> which always really bothered me that we live on a planet that's three fourths salt water, but right. we can't, can't get a bag get of that. saline. <laughs> right. But that's another yeah. podcast. But but now that was now it's every day, yeah, every day, and that, and and I don't want to blame the pandemic because this was happening prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I've got my soapbox items out of my system. Uh, so, <laughs> how long does it take? Is like for pneumonias, uh, we we feel comfortable going with a five day course of antibiotics now, mm -hmm. short from ten that we mm -hmm. works just as well. What, how long do you have to treat ear infections? Usually for ear infections, they still recommend 10 days. And again, that kind of depends on age of child and severity of the infection. Older kids, you can kind of get by with the five to seven days. So, so it kind of depends on how severe or significant you think the ear infection looks when you're examining the child and then how old they are. Because I, the amount of cardiac output, which each, each stroke of the heart or each beat that goes to the lungs is pretty high, 50% mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the ears, I don't imagine they have the blood supply that... I'm sure not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. So I think it definitely takes a while. And then, I mean, and a lot of times you, you have to realize that we're trying to kind of treat this almost, it's like a pocket of infection. Right, fluid, right, right, you know? right. So, so also, as long as those eustachian tubes are all clogged up, man, that fluid still isn't draining very well. And so that's another issue that we can run into with kids is that, okay, maybe we've cleared the infection. Like, you know, we've done the antibiotic course. The infection itself is gone that fluid behind the eardrum can linger for weeks, even after the and acute infection is done. And it can cause discomfort. Um, it can get reinfected sometimes. That's where some of those kiddos that get ear infections over and over and over again, it might be because they're just never actually ever clearing that fluid out from behind the eardrum. And, um, and the presence of having that fluid there all the time too, in itself can cause problems, not only discomfort, but it can really start to affect their ability to hear well. And when you're talking about an age group where um, hearing and speech development is so important, that can kind of cause problems sometimes too. So, so another reason that we will sometimes, you know, refer kids to to otolaryngology to talk about putting the ear tubes in is maybe they haven't had a bunch of rounds of antibiotics and acute episodes of ear infections, but they just have this chronic fluid that's back there all the time. Uh, sometimes those kids would benefit from the tube placement too, just to help with their hearing, help I, with their I've, speech I've, development. I've had patients. Uh, relatives, uh, cousin. I have a cousin that speaks fine now, and is mm -hmm. well, he's eight years in mid forties. Uh, but when he was younger, had recurrent ear infections and had a um, hearing and speech deficit yeah. or a delay because mm -hmm. the way he heard things wasn't like yeah, it's well, like hearing things through water. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, basically. yeah. It was yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it re reflecting back upon it, it was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, how how severe it was, and, yeah. and also impressive that how it got better too with uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so we we've talked about um, treatment, we've talked about mm -hmm. diagnosis, we've talked about that when to put in the pressure equalizing tubes. What about prevention? Okay, yeah, that's a good question because 
again, some of these I mean, you're things are kind of at the are, mercy of daycare. Yeah, exactly. And... Like some of these things are out, totally outside of parents' control. Anatomy will play into right. it. Yeah, you, if your kids have to go to daycare, they have to go to daycare, and that's totally okay. I always tell my my parents whose kids go to daycare, you know what? They're just getting all of these illnesses out of the way. Yeah, no, I Early mean, early in life, th- th- they'll be the smartest kid in kindergarten. They'll never miss a day of school, you know. But but yes, those first couple of years can be kind of rough in daycare. But um, but yeah, so some of those factors are kind of out of control. There are definitely some things that have been shown to be really helpful in preventing ear infections. And the number probably number one thing that I I want parents to be aware of is. Just getting your child's routine vaccinations actually makes a big difference with ear infections. And the biggest reason for that is the number one bacterial isolate or the bacteria that causes ear infections in kids is a pneumococcal bacteria. And we have an excellent pneumococcal vaccine. It's 13 valent, which means it covers 13 strains of the pneumococcal bacteria. It is, it's been a game changer for you know, not only ear infections, but pneumonia, meningitis, like all sorts of things. So just make, and that's just part of their, your, the baby's routine vaccination. So, so just making sure that they're getting in on time for all of their well exams and getting the recommended vaccinations, that in and of itself is gonna help a lot. Um, another vaccine that's really important to consider is gonna be the flu vaccine. So influenza vaccine is recommended for babies age six months and up, um, and that is, a respiratory viral infection and a bad case of influenza can definitely end up in a a case of an ear infection. So anything that we can do to kind of prevent those respiratory infections is gonna help and an influenza vaccine is also really important for that. There's two other things that have been shown to be protective. Breastfeeding for the first six months of life and avoiding tobacco smoke exposure. So those are the other kind of preventative things that you can do to help with ear infections. But I mean, there's plenty of parents that do all of those things really well and their kids still get right, ear right, infections right. and that's okay. And <laughs> I, and I'm guessing the breastfeeding has to do with imp- dissertation the, tubes, the yeah, sucking yeah, motion. That, uh, and then also just that that kind of passive immunity from mom, right. I think helps with that too quite a bit. So yeah, yeah. I, I, there's, uh, I've seen on the internet, just a statement that says, my kid has a face tag too. Don't worry about breastfeeding it doesn't matter or something mm-hmm. like that you know like they they breastfeed their kid they got a face tattoo yeah, when they're older right, so yes. you know. or I was always <laughs> yeah. told you can't uh watch high school graduation and go yeah breastfed that kid is breastfed, breastfed. no nope, <laughs> right? no nope, yeah, look no. at that's totally <laughs> exactly pharma. it yeah. doesn't matter no it really doesn't no no <laughs> although Tanya best breastfed both our girls which made my the nights easier mm-hmm. uh because like when they wake up in the night, they really didn't want anything. I had they nothing didn't, off. Didn't from. want anything to do with right. You. Yep. So that I, you know, from a, from a husband standpoint, uh, breastfeeding is just perfect. Except for when I start, when like parents start sleep training, that's when I start telling my moms like, this is where dad starts getting up in the middle of the night with the baby because of course they're gonna want to eat if it's you, but if it's dad, they might be persuaded to go back to sleep. Oh, is that it? <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. So I used to always get. What, you know, like, okay, sleep is so precious uh, when you're covering hospital call. Mm-hmm. Why are we arguing with a three-year-old that weighs like 40 pounds <laughs> in the right. middle of the night? If they want to sleep in here, I don't care. You know? yep, so, yeah, yeah. No, my no. wife is a stubborn bohemian. No, no, um, that's definitely one of those things where like, you got to do what works for you. But. Yeah, yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. One question to wrap up uh, the podcast, which you've done a great job, by the way, um, which met expectations of course um it, why why pediatrician um i chose to go into pediatrics probably mostly because i love kids um i i am the oldest of six kids myself and so i spent a lot of time growing up with lots of kids around all the time um i got to take care of my youngest siblings you know as i got older and um, I've just always really enjoyed enjoyed kids, enjoyed being around kids. I, I like in pediatrics just, I mean, you really kind of get the whole range as far as brand new, just born, all the way to heading out into the world, college, you know, all that, all that kind of fun stuff. I mean, so there's just a lot of transitions that happen during that time. They're so fun to see. And, and I get to, I like that I get to kind of see my own kids kind of grow along that, you know, so it's like, like my kids are all in school now, for example. So it's really fun now to talk to all my school age kids and like, okay, what are you into these days? My kid likes to do this. Like, what do you guys do? You know, so, so I like that. I like kind of 
how my family is growing along with all these families that I t help take care of. And then, um, and then, yeah, I think some of that too is just getting to grow with these families. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I've only been in practice for, uh, gosh, how long? like 12 years out of residency, 11, 12 years out of residency. So, but I have, you know, some kids that were older when I first started practicing are actually having babies now. <laughs> yeah, that's kinda, good. That's, that's, that's kind of yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. But that's been kind of fun too. Cause it's kind of like, Oh, and now I get to take care of your kids. And I'm sure, you know, as I get further along in practice, I'll have a lot more instances of that. But, um, but that's been kind of fun too. So just that, that whole idea of kind of just growing with these families, much like a family medicine doctor does too. But, um, but I also get to ship them off before they <laughs> start, start having all those <laughs> adult health problems. I can kind of avoid a lot of those too. And just by sticking with the kids. It definitely, so. um, I've always been in internal medicine, adult doctor, but having, volunteer to cover the urgent cares when they need help always mm -hmm. you know never afraid to see a kid and it, it is fun yeah mm -hmm. it's not fun when they're sick no you know and no especially when they're really i mean you know a lot of kids like yeah like they bounce back really quickly they do they're they do. super healthy at baseline it's the kids that that are that are really really devastatingly ill yeah. that is hard that never is really had hard. to do that yeah, i don't think no, i would like doing that yeah no that's really um, hard i'm glad other people like doing it yes. you know because oh, it's too. it's a need but uh <laughs> mm -hmm. you know the i mean i think here locally you know the whole wave after first quarter at the mm -hmm. football games you know yeah. makes us yeah if anything it's a it's it's a cool tradition people like to participate but it also mm -hmm. makes you pause and realize what you the things you should be thankful oh, for for sure you know, yes really. absolutely yeah. yeah a lot to be thankful for a lot and you know and again most kids are super healthy which is awesome like it's awesome to work with a population of people that are at baseline almost always really, really healthy. And that's great. And it definitely makes you thankful for that too. Right. So, yeah. But then you have to treat the parents though. Yeah. <laughs> right. I would say the majority of parents are delightful and I love working with them. And so, yeah, you know, there's always some, but <laughs> notice, notice she didn't say all parents. No, she not said a majority. all parents, but I would say, well, and you know, and, and honestly, even the parents that like Maybe we disagree on some things or maybe I don't totally agree with how they're doing it. I would still say like almost all parents at, at baseline want what's best for their kids. So even if we're having some philosophical differences on how they're approaching things, it really helps me to kind of step back and be like, this is still someone who loves their child, wants what's best for them, is trying to do what's best for them. And we're going to try to kind of work together to figure out what that's going to be, even if we have some, you know, disagreements about that, that this particular. Issue. Not to get philosophical, mm -hmm. but that's so true mm -hmm. that when you, I, you when you disagree with something, but you know the parent, they it's their kid, and they think that's the mm -hmm. best thing for them. That's what they ought to do. Yeah, you, 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 that's an immediate connection with people. For sure, you know, yeah. you, you're mm -hmm. like, okay, I get it, because mm -hmm. I would be the same with my kid. So, yeah. yep, yep mm -hmm. got it. Yeah. It's it's one of those you meet people that have no relationship with their children you're just yeah. like well it's so foreign mm -hmm. you know right yeah um, exactly and that, thankfully that's that's much less common don't have to deal with that a whole lot most people do a great job love their kids want yeah. what's best for that, them that being said just because yeah. i know they probably listen it's libby emma you still have to move out of the house at some point so, <laughs> and stay <laughs> there you go get off the payroll <laughs> and move away so <laughs> Dr. Farley, thank you for joining me. This is great information. Yes. You did a nice job. We can't wait to have you back. Uh, once again, this is Dr. Leanne Farley, pediatrician with UniPoint Clinic Pediatrics. For more information uh, or to find out, a, find a pediatrician for a, a, a ongoing care, visit unipoint.org. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.